Well, we're about a minute after noon, so I think we'll get started. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Great. Good. Well, thanks for joining us for today's, um, our November Lunch and Learn. This is the second of our series that we've been having going on. Um, today, we're going to be talking about grant making and charitable purpose. You're, when you join, you're all muted. So if you want to talk, make sure that you unmute yourself. And staff will be monitoring the chat box. So if you do have questions as we're going, please ask. We want it to be as conversational as possible. We'll also, I'm recording this um, event, so we will post that later so you can share that with any board members that aren't able to join us live. So to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about today, we fortunately have two staff members that took time out of their day to visit with us. Oh, I've got someone I need to admit. One moment. Um, so we've got Carly Winter. She's our Operations Compliance Manager with the Foundation, and she's going to be sharing the IRS Charitable Purpose definition, kind of giving you a little more in-depth look at that, as well as the expenditure responsibility process that we allow our community savings accounts to use when they want to give to a charitable group that maybe doesn't have their 501c3 um, verification. And then we'll have time for questions with Carly, and then we'll go into visiting with Ginger Neiman. She is our Senior Grant Program Officer, and she'll be talking about our grant making programs at the Community Foundation and how we've been addressing COVID-19 through our South Dakota Community Foundation programs, as well as providing matching dollars to our community savings accounts. And last but not least, we have Gail Wookie in Clark. She's with the Greater Clark Area Foundation. And she's going to be sharing with us how their community savings account has utilized those matching funds and, and the impact that they've made in the Clark community. So thanks to all three of you for being here today. So with that, before we jump into Carly's presentation, we did want to go around, like I mentioned, the virtual room and have participants introduce themselves. Um, and in addition to that, I have a poll. So I'll put that up on the screen right now. So as we're doing our introductions, and we'd like everyone to, to share their name, community, and your favorite Thanksgiving pie. While we're doing that, if you would visit www.menti.com, and you'll type in this code that you see at the top. And the poll that we have is really asking what areas of need have you seen increased due to COVID-19 in your community? So while we're doing introductions, I know it's kind of doing two things at once, um, but if you can jump on there and select any or all of those areas that you've seen increased need, we'd really appreciate it. So with that, I will start um, introductions. I'm Jamie Farman. I'm the Community Development Coordinator and I'm based in Pier. And my favorite Thanksgiving pie is pecan. So if anyone would like to go next, that'd be great. I can go, I guess. Um, I'm Carly Winter, like Jamie said. Um, I'm the Operations and Compliance Manager at the Community Foundation. I've been here for a little over a year, um, so I haven't had a chance to meet a whole lot of you just based on the circumstances we've been living through, but hopefully at some point that will happen. Um, my favorite Thanksgiving pie is some uh, pumpkin and cream cheese whoopie pies that a cousin of mine makes, which are not traditional pies, but they're really good. That sounds delicious. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I'm Sandy Jaspers. I'm from the Sisseton Area Community Foundation, and I like pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. I'm Gail Wookie. I don't, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Gail. Okay. I'm Gail Wookie. I'm with the uh, uh, Greater Clark Area Community Foundation in Clark. And my favorite Thanksgiving pie is a good old peach pie. Hi, I'm Janet Kittums. I'm the CEO of the Health Line Center, and I'm traditional pumpkin pie all the way. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, I'm Emily Hofer with the Freeman Community Foundation, and my favorite pie is a chocolate pecan pie from Magnolia Grill in New Orleans. We make it at home. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Valkamp. I'm the Director of Development for the South Dakota Community Foundation. And in all honesty, my favorite pie is whichever one is in front of me. Um, and my traditional answer at the holidays is, which one do you want? And I say both. A little sliver of each. Or a full size. Or a full size, whatever. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ginger, the Senior Program Officer here at the Foundation. I'm, I know this goes against everything. I am not a big pie lover. And so I have to go with cheesecake. <laughs> Mark Nelson from the Langford Community Foundation and any pie not made by me is my favorite pie. <laughs> I'm Beth with the South Dakota Community Foundation. I am situated, located out in Rapid City. And I like a little bit of pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving, but just a little bit with like a whole container of whipped topping on it. <laughs> More like whipped cream pie. Yep. Um, I'm Pat Gallagher with the South Dakota Community Foundation. I'm uh, based in Aberdeen and work in Northeastern South Dakota. And uh, I'm a simple pumpkin pie guy. Anybody else want to share their favorite pie? Okay. Um, sorry, I was on the phone. That's all right. Um, my name is Caroline DeCorey. I work at St. Francis Mission. I work for a nonprofit organization. We have about nine programs and I'm part of the advancement team. Um, my favorite pie is pecan. <laughs> pecan. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for sharing. And I see that we've got uh, quite a few responses to our poll. So we've got 29% um, said they, ha they saw increased need in their food pantries, 21% um, face masks and PPE, 17% telemedicine, and 8% for all four of the remaining categories, backpack program, senior meals, nonprofit daycares, and economic development assistance. So thank you for participating in that. That's interesting. So with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it over to Carly Winter. She's gonna um, take my the host away from me here. One moment. that work, Carly? I think so. I'm going to try to share my screen now. Okay. <clears throat> we'll see if it works. Can you see my PowerPoint there? <clears throat> Not yet. One, I, yep, there it is. Yep, I can okay. see. It looks great. There we go. Um, like Jamie said, uh, my name is Carly Winter. Um, I introduced myself a little bit earlier, too. Um, I'm the Operations and Compliance Manager at the South Dakota Community Foundation, so um, part of my duties are uh, reviewing uh, the policies and practices at the foundation um, and making sure we're doing things the correct, the right way on the up and up um, to make sure that we can continue to operate um, and serve everyone here. So. Um, one of the first things that we reviewed when I uh, started this position was uh, charitable purpose and then how that figures into our grant making um, and, uh, and uh, ways to accommodate um, CSAs, especially if they're looking to make grants to organizations that um, uh, aren't 501c3s. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, go to, let's see. 
There we go. A um, little overview. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what is charitable purpose and why it matters. Um, the, the differences between uh, nonprofit and charitable, because sometimes those terms get a little bit confusing. Um, we'll talk about the IRS def definitions for charitable purposes. Um, and then what are the options for granting outside of a 501c3? And then hopefully at the end, we'll have a little bit of time for questions and feedback. So what is charitable purpose? Um, charitable, pur charitable purpose is essentially what the foundation's looking for when determining whether or not we can make a grant to an organization. Um, charitable purpose is what sets a 501c3 organization apart from all the other different kinds of nonprofits. Um, and as we'll talk about in a bit, the IRS has very specific definitions um, for what what qualifies or what, what's classified as um, charitable purpose and we, what we would call that as a term of art. So there's actual meaning behind those two words when they're put together. Um, so you'll see nonprofit and charitable use interchangeably and they kind of mean the same thing, but they're um, also a little bit different. Um, a nonprofit organization is just uh, an organization that's formed um, for purposes other than making a profit. So there's no owner or board. That's not to say there's no income. It's just not used for individual or private benefit. Um, are nonprofit organizations tax exempt? Sometimes they are. You'll see that in a second. Um, who makes a designation as to whether or not an organization is a nonprofit? Uh, that's the Secretary of State in each individual state. Um, businesses have to apply or, or register with the Secretary of State. The same is true of nonprofit organizations. And so because of that, the governing law is largely state law, although there is some overlap. Um, a charitable organization is a type of nonprofit. So that's why those words get used interchangeably. Um, the, the charitable organization fits under the same uh, uh, definition as of a nonprofit, only there's a little bit more to it. Um, a charitable organization will have met additional requirements uh, placed by the IRS in order to qualify for some special tax treatment, which is the tax exemption. Um, so they are tax exempt. The IRS makes that designation. And so federal law is largely what governs um, charitable organizations. Another confusing thing to note um, is the EIN. I'm sure you've, you've been involved in uh, plenty of grant situations where you had to, to talk about uh, an EIN or a tax ID number. Um, just because this is confusing, I thought I would add this to this slide. Um, an EIN doesn't mean that an organization is tax exempt. Um, an EIN is simply like a, a social security number for a business or an organization and any, any business or organization can get an EIN. Um, it's the 501c3 verification letter that comes from the IRS that, that uh, denotes a, um, a charitable organization. Another way to look at it, if that's kind of confusing, is uh, to look at my awesome Wonder Woman umbrella that I've got here. Um, the uh, umbrella, think of that as all nonprofits, um, and then all these different types of nonprofits are underneath that umbrella. So a 501c3 is a charitable organization that is a nonprofit. Um, a 501c5 that is not charitable um, and is not tax exempt also is a nonprofit. A 501c4 is also a nonprofit. A 501c13 is also a nonprofit. Um, 509A2, 509A3, all those 509As, those are also um, nonprofits. That also gets a little confusing because all 501C3s also have a 509A designation, and so some people get those confused as well. But um, this is just an easier way to envision the, the umbrella of the nonprofit all over all the other types of nonprofits. So why does it matter? Um, Primarily in this situation, it matters because um, charitable purpose is what, what the IRS uses to um, determine whether or not an organization can receive a tax exemption. And the same guidelines are used to determine whether a grant can be made. So it's kind of a twofold um, 
use here. Um, South Dakota Community Foundation is a 501c3 uh, charitable organization and as such we can only make grants to other 501c3 organizations. Now a side note is that there are some loopholes, we'll kind of talk about those later. Um, and only donations to 501c3 verified organizations can result in that tax deduction. So that's why organizations um, seek out that verification uh, um, pretty, pretty heavily. Um, why it matters specifically to CSAs in this situation, because if you can identify a charitable purpose for your grant, um, you'll avoid some extra work down the road. Um, so what is charitable purpose? Uh, there are eight uh, clearly defined categories. It gets a little bit more convoluted towards the bottom. That charitable generally category at the end gets divided down further into several more categories. Um, but we'll go through each one of these individually. The first category is religious, which uh, would match up with what you would think of um, for a religious purpose initially. Um, there are two main requirements that the IRS has for uh, religious exemption. That would be that the beliefs of the organization must be sincerely held and that the practices, practices and rituals are not um, illegal or clearly contrary to clearly defined public policy. So for example, uh, I couldn't start the Church of Carly and say, uh, we're collecting donations to pay for uh, my, my monthly pedicure. Um, I, I, I firmly believe in that. Um, that's probably not going to fly with the IRS as a sincerely held uh, belief. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't check off that first category. Um, and then uh, making sure the beliefs or creeds or rituals aren't illegal. So like the Charles Man Church of Charles Manson, who's one of their rituals is, um, you know, taking the lives of others isn't going to be able to qualify. They're not going to be able to check that box because the uh, um, rituals would be clearly illegal and contrary to public policy. So when you're thinking about the religious exemption, um, this is going to be your typical churches. Um, conventions of churches would be like synods of the Lutheran Church, um, any associated missions, uh, integrated auxiliaries of churches, so uh, an altar society or Knights of Columbus. Um, and then institutions of religious instruction like seminaries or uh, theology schools and the like. The next category is scientific. So this would be uh, research that's basically done in, in the public interest. Um, the results of that, uh, oops, got somebody in the waiting room. Uh, the results of that uh, research must be made available to the public. So Coca-Cola doing a study on um, sh whether or not sugar is uh, uh, healthy is probably not going to qualify as a charitable purpose, a scientific study done in for a charitable purpose because it would be um, in Coke's interest and they're paying for it. Um, think in this case about studies done by um, universities, uh, medical schools, anything published in a medical journal, um, and other kinds of, of modeling or studies that uh, benefit the public interest. The next category is testing for public safety. This one gets a little bit confusing just because um, people tend to think that public safety is like firefighters and uh, law enforcement. Um, that's not really what this category is. This is actually a pretty narrow category. It's, um, it's pretty likely that you'll never use it. Um, but there's only two organizations that I could see that really um, actually qualify for this. Um, I've got the labels for the Underwriters Laboratory up there. They're an organization that tests um, manufactured um, machinery and that kind of thing. You might have seen a UL label on a furnace or a light bulb or something like that. Um, so they're testing for public safety. You can't miss the testing for on the front part of that. Consumer Reports is another organization that people are probably more familiar with. Um, they test everything from vacuums to coffee makers. Um, so uh, your traditional public safety nonprofits, traditional public safety organizations um, are nonprofits, you know, your, your volunteer fire departments and um, fraternal order of police and that kind of thing, but they're usually 501c4 organizations. So this is a pretty rarely used category. Literary is another limited use category. Uh, a lot of the things that you think would be literary are probably actually going to be educational. Um, to qualify for a literary exemption, uh, you must be able to show the IRS how the operation um, 
promotes a, a, a specific charitable purpose. So for example, a religious publishing house would also be promoting that exclusively charitable purpose of religion. Um, college bookstores would be promoting that exclusively charitable purpose of education. So it, it's kind of like a double charitable purpose requirement there. Um, you're, you're, you're probably not gonna use this one ever um, in your work. Educational, this is a very broad category that a lot of um, the work that you do will fall under. Um, there are two IRS requirements and it's an or. So you're either talking about training individual people to improve their skills or um, educate them on a specific topic, or you're talking about um, ed educating or instructing a, a larger group of individuals um, that would be useful to them or beneficial to the community. So this, th it's a wide gamut that this um, category runs primary and secondary school, colleges, but also uh, the, the book club at the local library, um, a museum, the orchestra, um, children's sports leagues are, are classified as educational, um, the little guy playing t-ball there, um, and daycares, some daycares if they have a um, specific uh, focus on education, like a preschool or something along those lines, might be uh, 501c3. So it's not all daycares. Um, if you ask a daycare if they're a 501c3 and they say they don't know, they're probably not because they will know if they've gone through that process. Uh, another pretty rarely used uh, category that's sometimes confusing is fostering national or international amateur sports. So a lot of times we think of uh, amateur sports is anything that's not professional. Um, in this case, the, the de definition gets narrowed down quite a bit more. Um, we're not talking about the YMCA swim club or something along those lines. We're talking about larger scale sports that have at least regional competitions. And the, the best definition that, that I found is um, like Olympic feeder um, organization. So people who are playing sports with an eye towards that higher level amateur competition. Um, these ladies are from the USA volleyball team USA Cycling or USA Wrestling, something along those lines. So this is probably a pretty rarely used category as well. Um, and your, your local sports teams, um, like, like the teeners baseball is actually gonna fall under education rather than amateur sports. Uh, prevention of cruelty to animals. Um, so this is geared towards safety and, and welfare of children and animals. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we have several of these organizations within our own state, uh, humane societies, um, locally, um, Children's Home Society and that kind of organization here within the state. And then there's also some um, national and international um, organizations. A lot of the things that you might you might think, well, maybe does that fit under prevention of cruelty to children? Um, that's probably actually going to be educational. Don't broaden the welfare portion of that definition. Um, we're really talking about preventing um, physical, sexual, emotional, mental abuse to children when we talk about that. Um, charitable. This is the one I said um, gets gets blown up again. Um, these causes that fall under the charitable exemption um, are, are varied, um, but they don't fit under a different category. And so the IRS kind of just lumps them all under this one category. It's the catch-all category. Um, a good portion of the causes that CSAs are looking at are probably going to fall under this category as well. Um, so think when you think charitable um, as a category, think of it as charitable generally. Um, and so the IRS breaks it down further into relief of the poor or underprivileged. So a lot of um, food uh, box programs are going to fall under that. Um, erecting or maintaining public buildings, monuments, or works would be, you know, upkeep of the local um, World War II memorial in the park. Um, defending human and civil rights secured by law might be a, a, a Voter, voter voting a voting outreach program that's not limited to one candidate or political party. Um, so this 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 category, if you can't find room somewhere else, you might be able to make it work under the charitable generally category. One thing to watch out for um, are organizations that look like they're charitable, but they're actually not 501c3s. Um, so your civic leagues, which would be, we see a lot of volunteer, volunteer fire departments or rotary, rotary clubs, um, well-deserved organizations, um, but uh, those are actually 501c4s. Um, 
any labor unions are going to be 501c5s, chambers of commerce and economic developments uh, organizations are 501c6s, rec clubs like country clubs are 501c7s, um, cemetery associations are 501c13s, um, and uh, organizations that serve uh, our veterans, uh, post or legion, those are 501c19s. Now some of these organizations might have uh, like a national uh, arm that has a foundation, um, and that might be a 501c3 that operates as a charity, but your local, uh, most of your local um, post and legion, um, chamber of commerce, etc., are going to be classified as nonprofits that are not charitable, that don't have that 501c3 designation. So um, put a, put a post-it note on this slide because we're going to talk a little bit more about these organizations later. So the question then becomes, um, if you can't uh, find a 501c3, but you have a charitable purpose in mind, um, what do you do? Um, so we really have three options. Um, that we can look at. One would be to, to have the organization get verified. Um, the other two would be um, some extra paperwork and uh, some oversight and due diligence and expenditure responsibility and fiscal sponsorship. So the first option, getting verified by the IRS as a 501c3, is not as difficult a process as people think it is. Um, it's, it's good because it takes away a lot of the extra work, it takes away a lot of the, the um, worry, uh, it would unlock opportunities for other grant making or grant receiving. Um, there's some uh, always question about how much it costs. Um, right now, the filing application fee for the 1023EZ, which is the short form application for 501c3, is um, $275. So it's not pocket change, but it's also not uh, the thousands and thousands of dollars that some people think. Um, and then the wait time is no longer prohibitive. Um, the IRS is, is saying about three weeks for short-term processing. Um, I found some people say as little as two. Some are saying it's taking a little bit longer when they uh, are a little bit inundated, especially when those grant, those new grant programs come out. Um, but the, the link to the 1023EZ form is right here. Um, there are some requirements to be able to qualify to fill out that shorter form. Uh, a lot of organizations in South Dakota are going to qualify for that. So um, that would be the, the, the first method that we would recommend. If that's not an option, um, there's also expenditure responsibility. Um, and expenditure responsibility is essentially the process that the IRS requires um, public charities to use if they're going to grant money to an organization that has a charitable purpose in mind but doesn't have their own 501c3 designation. Um, so basically it means the money gets doled out but someone has to be making sure that it gets used for the charitable purpose it was granted for and only for that purpose. So it's some paperwork. It's not usually as much as this picture would indicate um, but um, there is some extra paperwork involved. So in, in plainer terms, what that means is a foundation can make a grant to any type of or legitimate organization, you know, not the mob, um, but any type of legitimate organization anywhere in the world, um, even to this uh, beautiful casino in Monte Carlo and Monaco. Um, so long as the, the grant is strictly for charitable purposes. So for example, this, this Monte Carlo casino has um, a ballet company. And so maybe they have decided that they're going to provide ballet lessons for free to local underprivileged children. Um, you wanted to, to make a grant to them for that. Um, you sure could, as long as um, you're willing to uh, use expenditure responsibility to um, make sure that the money was used for the purpose of the ballet lessons and not to buy more um, blackjack tables or something. Um, side note, at this point, South Dakota Community Foundation is not doing international grant making. Um, it's possible, maybe in the future, but not right now. Um, this is really just for hypothetical purposes. Um, so I'll go through these kind of quickly. Um, organizations that don't require expenditure responsibility are the, basically the 501c3 organizations that we talked about before. Um, the IRS has a lot 
of different categories. Um, the ones that the, C, the CSAs are going to look at the most are the ones that fall in category one, um, the 501c3s, and then category four, which are units of government, because units of government by their nature are assumed um, to act as a 501c3 organization would in terms of um, being stewards of, of any uh, grant money. And so um, they're eligible to receive those monies as well without the use of expenditure responsibility. Um, some other categories there um, you can read over if you want. They're not um, especially relevant for today's discussion. Um, same thing here, uh, when must expenditure responsibility be used? Um, this is where that post-it note that I told you about comes in. Um, here we're talking about all those uh, um, nonprofit organizations that are not classified under 501c3. Um, your volunteer fire departments, your rotary club, um, chambers of commerce, Shriners, Masons, cemetery companies, the VFW, all those kind of organizations that, that have charitable purposes often but don't have their 501c3. So um, there are about eight categories that the IRS gives for when expenditure responsibility must be used. I only put these first three on here. You're probably only ever going to deal with the category with the organizations that fall under number one. Finally, fiscal sponsorship. Um, this is a situation where um, if expenditure responsibility doesn't work for some reason, or if there's a natural community partner for an organization, um, fiscal sponsorship could be used. That would be where a 501c3 organization steps into place for the grantee and takes the money and then um, doles it out for a, for a, a charitable purpose. Um, the fiscal sponsor does put their own 501c3 verification on the line when agreeing to act as a fiscal sponsor because they're, they're put in charge of overseeing that those funds are used for the purpose that they were applied for. Um, so um, that can be a much longer discussion um, when it needs to be. Um, but that's worked in the past for, for several of you, I know that. So um, any questions, comments, or concerns? I hope that you're less confused than this little guy on the slide here. Um, I'm willing to take questions, comments, concerns now, or um, you know, tomorrow or six months from now, my uh, contact information is there on the slide, so feel free to give me a shout. Thanks, Carly. Yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day for our CSAs, we really just have to ensure that the grants that we're sending out for your community savings accounts are falling under that IRS definition. So I think that's very helpful information. So thanks, Carly, for sharing all that. And as I put in the chat box, um, Carly's slides will all be made available after this so you can share it out with your board members so that they're all aware too. And Carly, if you want to um, send over um, the host to Ginger. I will do that. Thank you. You should have it now, Ginger. Thanks, Carly. Okay. Can you see it all right? Okay. Um, so, I am Ginger Neiman, the Grants Program Officer here at the South Dakota Community Foundation, and my office is located here in Pierre. And um, today I'm just going to talk a little bit about our grant programs. And um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to jump in or we can have time at the end for some questions as well. Um, so at the foundation, we have our South Dakota Fund, the Community Innovation Grant Program that we partnered with the um, partnership with the Bush Foundation, our Nonprofit Savings Account Program, and our Community Savings Account Program that I'm going to visit with you about today. So who can apply? Um, I think we got a lot of great information from Carly. And, you know, so if you're a nonprofit or charitable organization in South Dakota um, and your tax ID number is verified, um, then, then you're probably going to be eligible to apply. Um, we do mostly see 501c3 organizations that are applying, but 
Um, I have seen just a couple come through that are that have another designation, a C6, um, for, so for whatever reason they might be. Um, but the bottom line is give me a call if you're unsure and I would be happy to look that up for you. It's a pretty easy process for me. So let's say that um, you know you are not a nonprofit, um, but you're an organized or <clears throat> excuse me, you're an organized nonprofit, and um, so you could use a fiscal sponsorship. So somebody who is a partner of yours, and um, they could. Um, reach out to a fiscal sponsor and ask them to apply for you. Of course, all these projects must take place in South Dakota. So how do you apply? You can access our grant program um, from our website. I have the link listed here for you. And once you get out there, you'll see uh, the guidelines and the criteria. Um, all the grants are submitted through eGrant, our, our online grant portal. I have that link there for you as well. If you're new to eGrant, you'll have to create a login and a password. And I you know, really encourage maybe one per organization so that you all have the same information out there. And once you get into eGrant, you'll wanna click on um, the opportunities under the left-hand side. And I'd also encourage you to save often so that you don't lose your information. So our grant programs were all reprioritized in March um, when the coronavirus hit. And um, so what we did is um, we are just focusing on the, the efforts that you are using to uh, make an impact on those nonprofits that you serve. And so what we've done is set aside many of our traditional grant making guidelines and um, we, we didn't create a new application form for you to fill out. So you can go to our South Dakota Fund grant program to submit that application. So all requests during this time um, of coronavirus um, you know, you, you don't, that is what you should be focusing on. Um, and then just answer each question on that application as it pertains. Like I said, we didn't create a new application for this at this time. Um, right now, we are prepared to go through 2020 um, of just focusing on coronavirus efforts. And so um, with our South Dakota fund, which really is our unrestricted grant dollars um, that we've had available since the foundation um, became in existence, um, typically those areas of need outside of coronavirus have been, you know, the culture and economic development, education, health, human service, and financial literacy. So I would encourage you to keep an eye on our website. Um, we'll send out an email as well when we return to our normal grant making, but uh, we are prepared for the rest of 2020 to focus on coronavirus. Those grants will say, stay the same size of $2,000 to $20,000. We're gonna set aside those matching funds that we typically wanna see during this time, but um, the, um, the rolling part of our process remains the same with that letter of inquiry being submitted first and then an application. Um, some of the examples of some grants that we've awarded during this time, um, you know, basic human needs, you know, the food, the shelter, uh, mental health assistance, that protective uh, equipment, the PPEs, um, any supplies that the CDC has put out there uh, we've got the distance learning, telemedicine, technology, equipment, and then of course really anything that is program or project related expenses. And I think that really goes back to the, um, the poll that Jamie put out in the beginning. That's really what you are all seeing in your communities as well. 
So I want to talk just a little bit too about our community innovation grant program. So um, in partnership with the Bush Foundation, we've been offering these since 2014. But um, we decided uh, along with the Bush Foundation to focus all of those dollars in 2020 also for coronavirus. But to have on your radar, we most likely are going to be returning to those community innovation grants in 21. And so just as a guideline, you can see um, in 2019, we had three rounds of those grants and, and it'll be very similar to that in 21. So again, I just encourage you to either reach out to me to see what's gonna be happening or also we'll, we'll be posting that out on our website. Our nonprofit savings account grant program has remained the same throughout the coronavirus. Um, what they are is really um, an opportunity for nonprofit organizations to create their own endowed fund. And how you can do that, um, we are accepting those applications throughout the year. And um, what we're doing is offering a match. So if an organization, a nonprofit, um, decides that they want to apply for this and, and have been awarded, um, if they can raise $80,000 in a two-year time frame, the South Dakota Community Foundation will match that with $20,000. Um, that will help create an endowed fund with the, within the foundation. And that nonprofit organization will be able to give back the earnings to that fund um, for perpetuity at a 4.5% um, payout each year. This grant program can also be found on our website. And then that takes us to our community savings account. So as many of you know, your local CSA is a way for your community to get some projects done and meeting goals to improve the lives of the residents in your community. And so as your CSA grows, so does the amount available to give back because you all know that those dollars raised locally stay local. So the, we have partnered with about 80 CSAs in, in South Dakota. And what I would really like to um, discuss with you today and explain a little bit more is any nonprofit organization can apply to their local CSA and to the South Dakota Community Foundation. Um, by you partnering with the CSA, in your community and the South Dakota Community Foundation, that just helps leverage additional dollars for your program. For us, it provides a connection and a better understanding of the needs and the support that you have in your community. In March, uh, the South Dakota Community Foundation launched an initiative to match funding to CSAs for coronavirus efforts as well and it was seeded with dollars from the South Dakota Fund. If you look here, we have several organizations without the state of, within the state of South Dakota where these CSAs are located. And again, know that you can apply to that local CSA and to the South Dakota Community Foundation. I'm gonna just give you just a couple of grant tips here before I turn it over. Um, but I would just really like to um, make sure that you do your homework before you submit an application. Um, a lot of times, um, nonprofit organizations, um, they might see an email come through or they hear about a, an, uh, a new grant program that's out there and they submit that, you know, right away. Um, I think it, it, it's in your best interest if you can do a little bit of that homework and make sure you're eligible as Carly mentioned earlier today. And look at the deadlines of your program. Make sure that you have some pretty clear um, beginning and ending dates of your project. And then the budget, you know, you might need to get um, quotes or bids or anything like that. So it would be good to have a, a, a good understanding of what your budget looks like. And really, who are your partners going to be throughout this? Where else are you going to be receiving some funding? I always like to tell nonprofits to tell your story. Um, 
we have a grant making committee that is made up of individuals from all over the state of South Dakota and they may not know what's going on in your community. So it's important to be able to um, talk about what you've done in your community, um, what still needs to be done, what you know, what you want the future to look like. So be thinking about that when you're putting your application together. Um, another um, thing that I just wanted to bring up is this is a competitive process. So you are competing with other organizations across the state. So what is going to make your project stand out amongst the others? And then community support, you know, how is your project going to be sustainable going forward? What will the roles those partners play and, and where will you get those matching funds if you need those? Uh, the last tip I would just say is ask questions. Feel free to reach out to me at any time um, via email, phone call, whatever that might look like. I could, you know, maybe point you in the right direction of which program you should apply to or um, if, you, if you just want to bounce some ideas off of me, that's what I'm here for. And now I would like to turn it over to Gail Wuki with the Greater Clark Area Community Foundation. She is going to talk a little bit about um, some of the grants that they've taken advantage of there in the Clark area. Go ahead, Gail. Okay. Um... I'm going to start in March when the first letter came out from Jamie um, saying that the coronavirus, there was a grant available. Um, our city had decided, they held, held a big meeting and closed down a lot of the, um, the bars, the businesses, a lot of businesses had to be shut down. They could only do, um, the restaurants could only do dine out on, or carry out only. So, and our ICAP, which is um, our food pantry, um, was in a lot of need of food because people didn't have jobs and different things. So I reached out to the Community Foundation in March and received um, a $3,000 grant, the first grant, which was $3,000. And then um, our um, Greater Community Foundation in Clark, also gave the 3,000. So I, we were able to give 6,000 for our um, ICAP to help stock their pantry, which was um, very well needed in our community. And then um, in May, um, we, I was able to apply, another grant was available. So um, the bars and that had been shut down and um, so decided to apply for another grant um, which was a total of five thousand dollars that the South Dakota Community Foundation gave along with our matching five thousand dollars so um, our community foundation decided what we would do is we actually partnered with our Clark Rotary and they had received a grant from um, their district um, for $2,000. So they de we decided together what we do is hold a burger feed for our community, um, a drive through burger feed. And so the Rotary paid for all the burgers and, and all the food that went with it. And then the, our community foundation had bought $5,000 worth of beef bucks. Um, so it helped the local beef producers and we also bought five thousand dollars worth of Clark bucks so then the money had to stay in Clark and um, so we actually put twenty dollars in an envelope um, ten beef bucks and ten Clark bucks and handed them to all the people that drove through um, the burger feed um, so that was a that was huge the line was two blocks long um, we ran out of burgers. Luckily, we were at the um, grocery store, so they had extra burgers on hand. So we cooked close to 500 burgers um, through that drive through that people came and their families came. And um, so we fed the community and then everybody got Clark Bucks and Beef Bucks. 
Um, so that was a big success in our community. Um, and then in um, October, there was another grant available. And at the time, our local daycare is um, ran through our church. Um, and so it's a nonprofit daycare. And they were really struggling with workers. Um, our daycare had shut down, like the, everybody's schools and everything had shut down for two, um, just about two months, I believe our daycare shut down. So their workers went and found other jobs. And so then they started back up. Well, they got close to 30 kids when they started back up. And they had a heck of a time finding workers. And so um, we've even gotten where um, there was a note that said that they might have to even shut the daycare down due to lack of workers. So um, I reached out to, when I seen that there was another grant available, um, I applied for another grant. And so we were able to present to our daycare um, $5,000 but it was only to, it was to use to help um, with bonuses, sign on bonuses for workers. And um, so last week I was able to present them with a check and, and they've already had applications. And so that has been great. So for our daycare, cause I don't know what we'd do without our daycare in our town, especially when we got 30 kids and they have a waiting list for more kids soon as they get more workers. Um, and then the other part of that we have um, in our community, it's called the Clark Area Tragedy Group that um, we were able to present another check for 5,000 to them. And this group is where people in need um, say they lost their job and they can't pay their utility bill. This group will come in and and can individually help one person. They could help pay for some gas if they had a doctor's appointment um, due to different situations from the virus. Um, so that was a big impact in our town. So um, very thankful to the South Dakota Community Foundation for um, these three grants that, that we were able to apply for and get and um, it's been tremendous in our community helping us out with all this stuff. So um, if anybody has any questions, um, so that's kind of how we, what we're doing. Um, our community foundation has gotten, um, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about the day of giving, um, which is coming up December 1st, the day of giving. And so we have also partnered with the Clark Rotary again, and um, I'm going to just show you ours. We have put out cans, and the cans have the South Dakota Community Foundation. They also have the Greater Clark Area along with the Rotary, and these are in um, 18 businesses in our county trying to get money for the Day of Giving into our community, so the money will stay in our community and things like that so well that's great Gail thank you for sharing that I know you've been hard at work getting those dollars that we had granted out to work and we're glad that we could partner with you through those matching funds so um, for our community savings account partners we do still have dollars available so it is a first come first serve it's not a, a large amount anymore we've been distributing those all year but do be aware that there are dollars um, we will match up to five thousand dollars per grant for a community savings account that's giving to something that that is due to COVID-19 so we kind of had listed those buckets out of different categories that our community partners have been funding and assisting with. So keep that in mind. And I did in the chat box um, link to our COVID-19 page on our website. So please visit there to learn more about what Ginger was discussing around our internal foundation um, grants that we've been giving out as well as um, the community savings account matching grants if you're interested in that. 
And with that,